Hello, everybody. It is Kyla here from the Nutritional Revolution podcast, and we have a super impressive guest here with us today. This is Jess Sarah. She has um, been cooking things up in her kitchen, and by that I mean sports nutrition bars, and we are going to talk about that today. That is her JoJ bars, and then she actually has a background in applied exercise science from the University of Montana, as well as her master's in exercise physio from San Diego State. And she's gone pro Xterra athlete, pro triathlete, pro road cyclist. She's hitting all these categories. And now she's podiuming left and right in gravel. So she took uh, third just recently at Unbound 100. And then 10th, she had 10th overall um, in Unbound 200 last year. So just cruising along. Um, and we're going to dive into some things, you know, nutrition there for sure. And then she also hosts or helps run a couple clinics events. So she has a little rocks, uh, women's gravel camp that she started. And then she helps with the race directing for the last best ride, which I know she's been working on quite a bit probably because it's coming up in a less than a month now. So, um, busy, busy, but, um, I think Jess, thank you for joining us today. Thanks. That's quite the intro. It's actually not me. This is my clone doing the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I sound had, really busy. <laughs> yes. We had someone um, recently when we did a podcast, they're like, it feels good to hear somebody else say like all these things I've done. Cause it like that imposter syndrome kind of doesn't, you don't realize like all these feats you've accomplished and yes, it's impressive. So um talking about kind of the, the racing world of things. I mean, what got you initially into biking, cycling? Well, it's a funny story because I grew up in Whitefish, Montana, which you would think is a really outdoorsy place. And a lot of people ride bikes here, but it wasn't something that I did as a kid a lot. I Mm. I had a bike that I actually shared with my mom when I could fit on her bike. And I like to ride it around and I would like to think I was a natural at it. My mom tells the story of trying to give me a small bike to have the neighbor teach me how to ride it. And I just rode away from him like on my first try. <laughs> there you go. But natural. there was a natural, but there wasn't a lot of influence here for racing there. Mm. Nike didn't exist here yet. Mm. So I, I went off to college at the university of Montana and I decided to study exercise because I was a little bit timid and shy about what, you know, exercise could mean in my life, but I knew I gravitated towards being outside and mm. to endurance sports. I loved mm. running and hiking. And yeah. it wasn't until grad school at San Diego state that a research project, uh, where we were looking at elite cyclists and calcium loss through their sweat Oh, that fell into my lap. And awesome. so I had all these elite cyclists coming into the lab. And the, uh, the funny part of the story is this was a while back. This was like 2006, mm-hmm. 2007, before you could swallow a little capsule that monitors your core temperature. You had to use, back then we used anal thermometers. Lovely. (laughs) So I have all these guys coming into the lab and I'm like, I will pay you a hundred dollars to stick this up your butt and ride in the environmental chamber. I'm going to collect your sweat and then I'm going to tell you that you need to do more weight bearing exercise. Um, Sounds really fun, right? (laughs) Yes, exactly. The the life of research, right? (laughs) Right. So of course, all these guys want to know like, hey, have you done this? So I finally just put myself through the study. And with most research, you get a lot of baseline testing and VO2 max was one of the qualifiers to make sure that all of our subjects, we could say that their fitness wasn't altering the results of Mm -hmm. our study, Mm -hmm. that they were all within a certain range. And I did a VO2 max test and found out that I had an engine inside of me and oh my gosh told my professor was a cyclist and I just got started because she encouraged me to start riding with her team amazing uh, do, and with that study that you guys were doing out of curiosity the calcium losses and sweat and do, what was the do you recall the outcome from that study yeah so at the time what we know and what we still know is that as you acclimate to an environment, you can become more efficient with your sweat essentially. So you can start to reabsorb um, sodium and potassium as you're sweating, Mm -hmm. um, which requires you 
to take in less um, when you're competing and just be a little more efficient. We weren't finding the same thing with calcium. And mm. I think that's actually a lot of people don't know that you lose other electrolytes through sweat, like calcium yeah. and magnesium. Mm -hmm. And it, it's an interesting tie-in when we talk about Joe J's sister brand, Salt Stick, probably oh, on yeah. the interview later, yeah. um, that I actually have this background. So, mm -hmm. you know, with cycling, it's an, it, you're not weight bearing. So mm -hmm. it's already known to be a sport where you need to get weight bearing exercise in. So conclusion is if you're a cyclist, jump up and down 10 times a day, and that's going to help your bones. Amazing. Do a little jump rope or not. Yeah. Not even, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We definitely see with a lot of our clients to the like fractures, regular fractures and things like a lot, of, definitely in our runners too, but yeah, mm -hmm. super, super interesting. I'm sure that changed maybe how, or evolved how you maybe hydrate in your events too. Um, but before we kind of go down that rabbit hole, how did you get into making bars? So, and it's another story through sport. When I finished my master's degree, my plan had always been to do a PhD and I wanted to continue in environmental studies field. And I got distracted by cycling. Yeah. And it's easy. It's easy to do. It's really easy to do. Yeah. I was getting results in mountain bike races. I was getting results at Xterra races. And I, I wanted to pursue that. And it's, it's hard financially to become a professional athlete. Yeah. And it's not a myth. We know that, especially for women, it, it's even harder to make a living. Yeah. So I, what I ended up doing is I started a private chef company, oh, um, cool. sort of with a friend of mine who was a nutritionist and I had mm -hmm. been working with her, helping her cater parties and awesome. she moved, left me some of her clients. So I started working for these clients, um, in racing and, training full time. And I sort of had that creative side to me and a lot of experience in the kitchen combined mm -hmm. with my knowledge of physiology and nutrition. Yeah. And then, so it's funny when you come from that world and then you apply that to becoming an athlete. And I was having real GI issues and exterior. Mm -hmm. I remember specifically being at the world championships and running into a bush on the run and oh, shoot. Yeah. Yeah, it was not, it was not good. And, and I was thinking, I just can't seem to get my calories right on the bike so mm -hmm. I can then get off and run. And mm -hmm. I started looking at the products available and it was, it was very much like a lot of sugar, a lot of carb heavy, mm -hmm. um, maybe real food, the real food revolution wasn't a thing back in 2000, yeah. 2009 yet. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to recreate something and because I'm such a foodie and I don't like to waste my calories on things that don't taste good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought, I'll just make a bar that tastes like a cookie. Yeah. And I knew that it needed to be gluten-free because I could tell that's where the industry was going. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also had a coach who had Lyme's disease and oh. was told to be on a gluten-free diet. So it was kind of this science experiment mm -hmm. in my kitchen, um, wanting to bring a little bit more fat as fuel into the bar, wanting to use only real fruit ingredients, not using a preservative to this day. We still don't even use natural preservatives. We use mm -hmm. honey. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that was, yeah, long story, <laughs> but that's how the bars came about. And once I started taking them to races and sharing it with my crew, mm -hmm. it exploded. And before I knew it, I was up all night long, baking pans of these bars, wrapping them in foil. There were shops in Encinitas, California that I was living at the time that were selling the bars like under the counter to customers <laughs> because people just, they wanted them. They were like, these yeah. taste like cookies and they're healthy. And yeah. Um, yeah. So I was a little bit ahead of the curve with my idea, but not with my business plan. <laughs> mm, yes. So. Yeah. I know that's something I always, um, think about is like, they don't teach you the business stuff in school, you know, they don't. I, w I really wish that there was more of that. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So what did the original Joe J bar look like? What did it look like a cookie? 
It was a square because I was okay. putting them in like, you know, oh, a big casserole dish. dish and baking mm-hmm. them. Nice. Yeah. And uh, the first one was the peanut butter chocolate chip flavor because I just felt like it was approachable to figure out the recipe. And yeah. my coach asked me to make one with coconut and white chocolate. And mm. those aren't my favorite things. And yeah. our white chocolate coconut blondie to this day is our top seller and our signature flavor. So no way. <laughs> that's awesome. Her. Yeah. That's great. It is definitely a unique flavor. Like I think you have some different flavors that like I haven't seen on, on many other products. Like, um, before we started recording, I was telling Jess that when I ordered a bunch of her bars and the she has a pancakes and bacon flavor. So that was the first one I had to try. Um, yeah. and I got that like maple syrup vibe, like smoky bacon flavor. So definitely. And, and mind you, it's, it's, uh, it's, is it vegan too, even? So if honey vegan, we call it. Vegan. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah. So there's not actual bacon in the bar for those. Yeah. Listening, but, um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a great lineup of flavors. Like lemon blueberry quinoa is another one you guys have. Um, espresso chocolate almonds, like a solid flavor, I'm sure for many people, but yeah, I, the lineup here. And then you have a, um, was it the apple spiced walnut or something was the other one? Apple walnut cake. Yeah. That yeah. one is good. So good yeah. mix up of, of flavors there for sure. So with the, the bar, I, I mean, how do you use those with your training and racing? Were you using those during, or was it kind of like a recovery or a snack or how did you use those? I really wanted to use them during, and I still do. And I also use my professional friends to test out on. And I had friends who were also having GI issues and triathlon. So keep in mind, this is still back in my triathlon days and people started eating them on the bike Mm -hmm. and they were able to start eating more and get more calories in. And they were having PRs on the bike and in their like overall race. Nice. So I knew, I knew that I was onto something. Uh, I think it's definitely now that my lifestyle is different and I've pivoted a little bit more into my career and less racing full time. I see the application of the bar as like a grab and go breakfast Mm -hmm. or even sometimes like lunch or a snack for me. Mm -hmm. I don't usually use them for recovery Mm -hmm. and I definitely use them all the time when I can ride and train. But I, after, you know, over 10 years of making them, I'm not sick of eating them. That's good. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah. The flavor fatigue can be a real thing. I think for some people too, when they're racing those long events, you know, so having a variety of, of like sweet and even like kind of like savory, like the pancakes and bacon kind of stuff is good to have that mix and that variety for, for athletes too. So I think that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And, and that's what's next for us is where I'm working on, we have a salted chai flavor coming out this Ooh. fall. It'll be a limited edition and it's good. It, it might be my favorite one yet. It's yum. Really, it's almost like a spiced oatmeal cookie. Yummy. It's really delicious, but yeah. I am definitely tuned into the savory sweet concept mm-hmm. and without giving much away, I'll just say that there's things coming. <laughs> Some special secret surprises coming down the JoJ yeah. pipeline. That's yeah. awesome. Well, um, yeah, we're, we are excited to, to test and order some of those for sure. And so kind of with the bar world, I mean, where, where do you see that going? And, and, and also was that challenging? I mean, it sounds like in your community, people are picking the bars up easy, but it also seems like it's a very maybe hard to enter into market because mm-hmm. there's so many bars out there. I mean, did you feel like, I mean, it sounds like your bar picked up pretty easy for the most part. Did you ever have any like struggles starting the company or getting it out there? Or? Yeah, there's definitely been some ups and downs. I listened to a podcast called how I built this on NPR. Oh, yes. And yeah. it's, that podcast is like my therapist because yeah. every food company on there <laughs> goes through this stuff and you're just like, yes. oh, yeah, okay, I can get through this. It's yeah. Okay. With like, as I mentioned, no business background, it yeah. was a huge learning curve. Um, and I think the market 
is saturated now. It is, but I've seen, you know, this has been tough times, like going through COVID, we lost a kitchen. We mm. moved to a new kitchen. I brought on a new partner is actually my boyfriend's dad. Oh, cool. Um, I learned so much from him. He was an incredible teacher that did not have an ego to this day. He still doesn't even like to take any credit, um, but I attribute a lot of our growth and in, into our acquisition point to working with him. We, I wouldn't say we got lucky with REI, but I hit REI at a time when they were still allowing um, vendors or companies to send in samples. Mm. And I found the buyer on LinkedIn and it turned out that he went to a different school in the University of Montana and they were our football rivals. So I sent him a message heckling him about his football team. And I, I just thought, this has to work because he probably gets hit up all the time mm-hmm. and he liked it and he took oh, good. the samples and then they liked the samples. So REI was our point of national growth other mm-hmm. than like brick and mortar bike shops, coffee mm-hmm. shops, mom and pop climbing and outdoor retail stores mm-hmm. that I just made connections with by being scrappy or visiting when I was traveling that getting into REI And also getting into a store that really aligns with our mission of community um, inclusion and diversity and Mm -hmm. the things that we're trying to do in our brand, it allowed us that platform. So that was really big and um, a a huge reason why JoJ was even in a place where I could sell this company. So um, yeah. That's, do, I, do you I, still own JoJ or did you sell? No. Nope. I sold JoJ to a private equity firm that is, we're basically building a platform of sports nutrition brands. Cool. This platform is called Elite Active Nutrition. Okay. And it's actually spelled A-L-E-T-E, which symbolizes all athletes, not oh, I love that. athletes. Yeah. So a little play on words. Um mm-hmm. So the company first acquired Salt Stick, okay, which is an electrolyte brand founded yeah. by Jonathan Toker, who was a triathlete and chemist. And mm-hmm. then they purchased JoJ, and then we purchased Bonk Breaker, oh, also cool. um, founded by an athlete. So the theme here is athletes who are passionate and mm-hmm. who are founders coming in and working with the brands. And yeah. that was a big reason why I sold, and I still own a tiny little piece of it, but I basically got to create my own job within the company, which is VP of product development and community development. Amazing. That's awesome. So you're still involved with the process as well. And you get to kind of see where it's it's going and help direct that. That's amazing. Amazing. And I think there's definitely some, I would imagine some crossover or depending on the timeline, like sounds to me like you're a (laughs) go-getter and whether that comes from the cycling world and then like excelling there. And then that translates into the, your business life too. It's, um, definitely very respectable too, for, um, someone who, you know, keeps pushing forward and cruising on. And like you're saying, reaching out and, you know, fingers crossed the the guy reaches out because of the football joke or what, you know, it's like, yeah, that is, um, I, I, I respect that. I think that's impressive. So yeah, kudos to you for, for doing that. So, I mean, with the bar stuff, how many bars, if you are going like something like unbound, like, are you taking your bars there? And if so, how many bars are you eating throughout a race like that? I, I'm glad you brought up that specific race because the 200 mile race at unbound, which I think was actually 206 miles the year I did it. (laughs) Of course. Miles on a bike is a distance in itself. So you can only imagine all day when you have to like tack that six miles on to every chunk that you're checking off in your mind. But yeah, so the longest race I had ever done prior to that was Gravel Locos in Texas, Mm. which was 155. Mm. And that was a very different course. It was a little smoother, faster. And the course that I raced at Unbound was the North course, Mm. which is chunky and Mm -hmm. slower than the South course, which I did this year. And the reason why I bring that up is because it adds to the complexity of like even getting to your pockets and yeah 
thinking about what you're doing, especially when you're in a group yeah. and it adds to the time. So my race time was 13 hours and nine minutes. Oh my goodness. And yeah. I mean, that's basically that like an Ironman time, but you're yeah. doing the same thing the whole day. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> so I really, I put a lot of thought into it, especially because it was very hot and mm -hmm. I didn't want to cramp. Um, and I really focused on my nutrition that week. And I basically like, I just overate and I felt kind of large yeah. <laughs> when I got yeah. to the start line, but I know that that really helped me. And I think that's a mistake that athletes make when they're tapering is athletes tend to feel fat when we're not training. And so mm -hmm. it's like, you don't eat enough. So I think that sort of set the stage and then your, your gut and your system is going and it's processing and it's ready to take on a lot of calories Absolutely. the day of an event. So I had six JoJ bars that day. Wow. I had 55 salt stick fast chews, oh which gosh. are like our sweet tart chew. Oh, okay. Two of them have a hundred milligrams of sodium. So wow. I did the math and I basically took the recommendation per hour nice. and my mouth was raw, but I didn't cramp. And I yeah. felt, I mean, as good as you can feel. Yeah. Um, I also had eight untapped maple syrups. Um, nice. And I'll give that brand a shout out. My friend Ted is um, one of the founders of that brand. And I'm a huge fan of maple syrup over gels. Yes. Um, yeah. And I also, it's something that I don't get sick of and it doesn't seem too sweet to me. Yeah. So those are really, really essential that day. And then I had some rando stuff at the, you, there's only two aid stations where you. That's right. Yeah. People. And so that's just, it's like, it's not enough. Right. <laughs> Oh, you that much. You're just so thirsty and just yeah. tired and really happy to see someone that's going to take care of you. Yeah. I had packed people told me like, just put stuff there that you think you might want. And I had Brazilian, those Brazilian cheese balls. What, I, wait, you, what are these? Tell me those. I have like not heard of Razi bites or whatever they're called. I have not heard of these. Oh my goodness. Let's link these in the show. Notes. They're like a bread <laughs> cheese ball. Oh my goodness. It sounds delicious. <laughs> I had donuts. I think I had like a donut and a half and an apple juice random. I, yes. I picked a bunch of juice yeah. at the first one. And the second one, I definitely had those bread cheese balls. I needed savory. And I also think I had yeah. a Coke. Mm, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so two like stops amazing. overall over a hundred oh. miles and that's yeah. to top off water too. Yeah. And so I had camelbacks like prepped in advance for them to give to me. Yeah. So it was, the first one was a really quick stop. The second one was more like, um, Hey guys, I need to lay on the ground for a minute and just let my back <laughs> relax. Oh gosh, stretch out. Yeah. So, Goodness. um, it's, but it's a, it's cool to experience. I I'm not sure I'll ever do that distance again, but yeah. Yeah. You think you want shorter or longer distance? No, shorter. That's why I did the hundred this year. And I also have this like crazy fear that I had a good day. I felt good that day. Yeah. And that's this such a big difference. Like I started with Ted's wife, Laura, she's one mm -hmm. of my best friends. And we had planned the whole day together. Mm -hmm. She got a flat early on when we oh, were shoot. still in a large group yeah. and we had decided in that case that we would leave each other. And then she got like pretty affected by the heat and, mm -hmm. and like real, actually really affected by the heat sure. and got yeah. pretty sick and wasn't able to finish. And sometimes that just happens. Like for women, our menstrual cycles can affect things like that. Yeah. Um, and I got lucky at where I was and how I was feeling mm -hmm. because I definitely had, when you don't feel good in the heat, I mean, I'm yeah. sure, you know, yeah, it is, it's like not feeling good at altitude. You're just, yeah. Dumb. Yeah. Do so, you, um, do you, was, do you know if your friend was like in her high hormone phase when she was racing? That's a good question. I, we never talked about that. She struggles with heat generally and was mm -hmm. pretty nervous. Like there's FOMO when it comes to unbound, right? Like you, everyone mm -hmm. wants to try it. And I kind of convinced her to try it. My, my, what I said to her was, well, what if next year, if you're pregnant? And then ironically, she had her baby six days after unbound this year. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. Good point. So yeah. I got her. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
she also, she was like my emotional support friend at that race. It's a big mm. thing. It's like really different than any other race. And it's kind of overwhelming when you get there. I think I did like 10 interviews on wow. Thursday and I was like, what's happening? Like it just, all of a sudden the pressure that I used to feel with racing came mm. back and mm-hmm. I felt very, very nervous and not like myself. And having her there was, I attribute like the reason why I even started and had such a good day to having her there. Um, that's awesome. So that's, that's a good friend to have. <laughs> yeah. Plus we're both like really intense and like we, our personalities match a yeah. lot. <laughs> that's, awesome. that's good. There you go. So, I mean, do you know how many fluid ounces you consumed over like a 13, you said 13 and so hours? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, two camelbacks that are both a liter and a half. Wow. No, three. Is that right? One, two, three, start. Yeah, three. And then I had two small bottles. Um, one, two, three, four. And there was one random water stop that I stopped at. So mm. seven, eight of those with. Wow. Yeah. So it was a lot. I've never actually calculated the fluid. Yeah. I says I should do that. Did you, have you ever done any sweat testing for your, well, maybe with the research situation too, like to determine mm-hmm. your fluid losses in different environments or. Yeah. And I'm pretty hyponatremic to begin with, which okay. for listeners who don't know, it's like, I'm low on sodium. I'm low on electrolytes. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that. And I'm also just very attentive to the, here's the thing about coming from a professional racing background is that you just learn how to take care of yourself and be efficient in ways that you can't, you can't get that unless you've been in those scenarios to the point where it starts to numb it down a little bit Mm. because it's intense and it's scary. And there's people around you like the start of these races are mass 1000 people starts. Yeah. They're big and you have to have you have to have it within you to stick to your plan, to understand like when it's time to not go that hard and Mm -hmm. to make sure like you start grabbing for that food Mm -hmm. really early. And, and I think that just makes such a big, big difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, if you, when, once you mess it up and you start to get behind, it's like, you also have that mental crash, Mm -hmm. which is no fun either. Yeah. Um, So And coming to Unbound, I mean, Montana, are you slightly at altitude there? Mm -hmm. Whitefish is only at 3,000 feet, surprisingly, because Mm -hmm. we get weather of like five to 8,000 feet. Okay. It does help a little. Yeah. Um, I know that I felt it help when I go down to sea level. And I went to Fort Collins last weekend to my friend Whitney and Zach's event called Mm -hmm. Fogo Fondo, um, Mm -hmm. a gravel race they have there. So 5,000 feet, when I used to come from California to Colorado, I would be just wheezing yeah. away, but I didn't feel any different. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is better. That's good. That is good. Yeah, that that makes a difference. I think for sure, even too with um, like even heat management a little bit, because you're maybe used to a little bit drier environment and and maybe have a little bit of increased uh, red blood cells compared to a little bit lower altitude. So hopefully that helps pay off um, in those situations. Do you do any like heat training or sauna training or any of that stuff? No, I have done like specific blocks in the past where I'll Mm -hmm. travel somewhere for altitude or heat Mm -hmm. training. I it's really cool now that we know there's crossover with both of those, with the physiological adaptations. Uh, I've watched my partner, Sam do some sauna training, um, to the point where the way that you do that is you basically do a block of it farther out than you would think from your event. And you, after your ride, you have to immediately get into the sauna or that situation and drink no water. And he once did a road race in his sauna (laughs) block that was like out in the middle of nowhere. And then he brought a sleeping bag and he got in his car in the sleeping bag and turned the heat on for 20 minutes. So he wouldn't interrupt the protocol. And then he went somewhere hot and had an amazing race and felt fine. Wow. (laughs) It worked, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I haven't ever done that specific sauna protocol like him. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that is the the tricky part. I think for many of our athletes, it's fi- well finding a sauna, but I haven't heard someone do the sleeping bag heater technique. <laughs> I get a lot of questions about can I go in a bathtub? Can I go in a hot tub? But that is yeah. um that's a good one to add to the list. <laughs> that's that is yeah. like, that's pretty interesting. I was like that's pretty creative. <laughs> yes, definitely. And so what is talking about kind of the sports nutrition side of things, what is your like post racing or, or post maybe a hard training session nutrition hydration? look like for you typically? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of chocolate milk. I think it tastes good and it's super easy. If I can make my own sort of like blended up smoothie, Mm -hmm. I'll do something with like maple syrup and maybe a little yogurt and banana and just make sure to get enough, uh, carbohydrates in replace glycogen stores and then get that meal in, you know, Um, I think I, I tend to sway to the side of like all overeat versus under eat always. Mm. I hate the feeling of bonking. Mm-hmm. I, I am of the body type where I thrive on, on not being very, I'm not a very small person. And so mm. in times where I've like tried to lose weight for a lot of climbing races or something like that, I just don't feel right. And then I mm-hmm. lose power. Yeah. So I'm very much like on top of my nutrition. And I think that in doing that for so many years, I've watched my body actually become leaner and my metabolism really just like fine tune. Yeah. Um, and I don't actually put a lot of thought into like, if I go get a bit ba- something from a bakery or, you know, I just eat and it, my body will take care of it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I like to Food share freedom. that a lot with women and friends who struggle. I feel really lucky that I've never had an issue with food. Yeah. I've definitely had an issue with the way that I wanted my body to look in the past. Like mm-hmm. I have had an idea of what a professional athlete looks like and then mm-hmm. realize that maybe my body doesn't take on that shape outwardly, but my physiology is there and yeah. testing that. And then also like, maturing as an athlete to a point of celebrating it and, Mm -hmm. and, and really like showing women, if you look at like the Peloton, like the tour de France Mm -hmm. Peloton right now, you're going to see all these different body types of women who are at the absolute top of their game, who are so incredible. And you didn't see that as much. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really good, it's good for other young athletes to see that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's really important that you mentioned that. And even too, when you mentioned like the, not like you didn't say, you didn't call it carb loading, but like eating more in the week before and like not being afraid of like, how, you know, that feeling of maybe feeling quote unquote fat or heavier or bloated or whatever. And I think that is something we see and run into with a lot of our athletes, male and female, honestly, mm-hmm. um, the carb loading, it scares them. It it feels like wrong to eat that many, you know, carbs and stuff like that. So I think, yeah, having knowing and practicing that too, I think is important, but yeah, having the, like you're saying the maturity to, to, to celebrate that I think is incredibly important and listen in and fine tune and see it's not that lighter is always faster. And I think that's something that does need to be talked about a little bit more, um, for sure. Cause I think there is that perception of like you're saying, what, a what does a pro mm-hmm. athlete, like, what are they su- su- quote unquote supposed to look like? And, and I, don't, you, I mean, you hear a lot of pro athletes too, sharing their stories where it's like, maybe their body looked like that, but it was broken. Like they were getting mm-hmm. injured and their hormones okay. are messed up, you know, and like overtraining is going on clearly because they're not supporting that those efforts with the nutrition side of things. So I think it is really important to, to talk about that and, and listen to your body and and, you know, sometimes the coach doesn't always, like, I think that's a lot of what it was is like the coach, mm-hmm. a lot of times coaches were pushing people to get this, this lighter look or yep. not easy to eat as much, unfortunately, which is, um, which is a bummer, but, um, sacrifice and performance or women were losing menstrual cycles and stuff like that. So yeah, not good. Um, yeah. so talking about women, women's bodies cycling. Can you, can we dive into the gravel camps that you started and and like why you started that, how you started that? What is it? 
So yeah, it. It, it this has been like one of the best parts of my year was these camps that we I did four of them in June. And I oh, wish cool. I could do them throughout the summer, but it gets so busy with our event that we host, our gravel cycling event. Mm-hmm. So last year, uh Kim Rogers, who is the new senior marketing manager at Pinarello, reached out to me and she said, I'm building this team of athletes and we're going to focus it a little bit more around community and activation and less around race results. And cool. You've been recommended to me. And after talking to her, I was like, this is something I want to be a part of. The timing is right. It's exactly Mm -hmm. what I need. And what we decided is a big part of my my program was going to be the mentorship and starting some clinics specifically up here in Whitefish awesome. where, like I said, as a kid, there, there's wasn't a lot of access. So we do have NICA now, but I don't think there's a lot of like road or gravel opportunities, especially for women. And yeah. for me, I thought that there was maybe like five women here that rode gravel. And it turns out that I've just tapped into about 40 women. This Amazing. is a small town. Yeah. Um, and also I'm really proud of Sam and me. When we started our event last year, this is a mountain biking community and people were kind of like, wait, why would you ride a gravel bike instead of a mountain bike? And now (laughs) everyone owns a gravel bike and the entire town is racing our event. So we've really like help to push that. And I think it, it just, it is a little bit more inclusive. And in Montana, you can't just go out anywhere by yourself and be a hundred percent safe. So, yeah. um, anyways, I digress back to the camps. So I started a mentorship program up here last year where I found four high school women, three of them were 15 years old or two wow. were 15. One was 17. Okay. One was 16. I don't know. High school girls, yeah. uh, Carrello provided bikes Amazing. and we did a camp where I invited as many women as I could find from the community into the camps. And it was so, it was so adorable. We had like a 50 year old woman teaching a 15 year old girl. And then like five minutes later, her showing the 53 year old woman how to do something. Oh my goodness. Like, so it's just like, it shows you what we know bikes, how it brings people together yeah. and it's like a shared passion and how special and empowering it can be. Yeah. Um, so I had 12 women do the two, we did two camps last year. And then those four girls did the race, oh, cool. um, completed the race. One of them actually did the 90 mile race. Oh my um, gosh. Which is incredible for a That is. Oh so my goodness. She's, um, yeah, she's actually on a, de- a development team through team 2024 20, this year. So oh, she cool. has some talent. Her name is Charlotte. Um, Absolutely. So in thinking about that, I regrouped with Kim and we were like, we want to grow these. Like, this is, this is great. This is actually doing the work and rolling up our sleeves, not just saying like, we're inclusive and we're getting mm-hmm. people into the sport. So I planned four camps this year and they center around every camp has a topic mm-hmm. and our, I could not do this without the help of some very key people. My friend, Sarah White actually works for Specialized and awesome. she comes in and teaches the mechanical side of the camp. Cool. And she's like a, she's this like tiny little petite blonde girl, but she's such a boss and she's yeah. like a faster mechanic. <laughs> and it's just so great to see oh her goodness. teach these things. And I learn from her every time I watch her teach. Amazing. So we do a mechanic clinic. And then my friend Stella Hobbs owns the local bike shop, Great Northern Cycle and Ski with her husband. And she allows us to use her space and awesome. just is also like a really, she was, um, she raced cross country uh, North racing in college and just such a natural athlete. And a lot of women here look up to her because she's like, just good, naturally good at everything. So, um, it's nice to have like women in the community teaching other women. And the first day of the clinic, we had a bunch of no shows. And I think Mm. like only 12 people showed up. And then the second day it was like, can I bring my friend? And then by like the last day, every single person had found out and wanted to be there. So we did awesome. a nutrition clinic. We did a skills nice. clinic. Um, and then we did an entire day devoted to plugging a tire, 
plugging a tubeless tire. Awesome. And then we rode, um, and Penarello basically supports the clinic with food, like financially. And then all of my partners from Giro giving helmets to Velocio providing apparel wow. press cycle gives every, um, woman a, their own like kit with a tool and a torch wow. tool and, all of that. And, um, obviously our nutrition brands providing Amazing. nutrition. So it's just like for brands to step up and to provide products like Wahoo sending bike computers, nice. that's a really big deal. 100% yeah. since sunglasses. So they show up and they get like this whole pro pack. Yes. And wow. you're already feeling inspired. Yeah. You know, yeah. To have something like that. And then just to be around other badass women. Definitely. So the idea is I would like to grow these clinics and maybe have a few locations across the state, so um, maybe coordinate with some other smaller races to plan like clinics the weekend before events, Yeah, kind of like the skills and tune up stuff. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this. Um, Absolutely. Planning. Yeah. And are the clinics a couple days or a single day? Yeah, this one was four days. So every day nice. got its own topic. Cool. Um, and I learned that teaching the first time that there's a lot to cover. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you forget that when you've been doing the same thing forever that like, I'm like, oh, I plug my tire, put the CO2 in, I keep going. Mm -hmm. But when you haven't done it before, you need the time to yeah. learn and feel comfortable. And then also to understand like, what is a tubeless rim? Like how, mm -hmm. why isn't, how does this work? Like it's, yeah. it's cool to teach that. Yeah. That's awesome. And are these like all day for full, like full four days? Yeah, pretty much maybe like six to eight hours. So okay. a good solid chunk of the day. Yeah. yeah. And are you doing any sessions where like, are you getting out on the bike every day and doing little or little or long. <laughs> yeah, events, I'm sure. That's yeah. Awesome. The first two, it actually, it was a pouring rain. And when I say pouring, I mean, like we had to go inside the bike shop and take over the mechanics station because we couldn't even be outside. And I had, um, Dominique powers is a photographer in the cycling industry. That's known for her portrait photography. She's actually at the tour de France right now, shooting the Thames race. She's incredibly talented. She came and joined the first two clinics and did some photography. <laughs> it was like Amazing. pouring rain. <laughs> oh my goodness. We rode one day for an hour and she still managed to get amazing pictures of the clinic and some of our community leaders. But <laughs> I was laughing. I was wow. like, gosh, maybe. And then she kept going on to like other events and it was raining everywhere she went. And we were cracking up because <laughs> it's not easy to do photography when it's raining. Yeah. Yeah. Good for her for, for getting out there and, and getting it done though. That's, that is difficult. So let's see, I want to be mindful of your time here. So we're getting close on time, but where, where can people like, I know I've seen you do Joe bars at events, right? So mm -hmm. where's the next event or next couple events where you, people could see jo a Joe Jay? Stand. So our event, the last best ride is a cycling event here in Whitefish, Montana and Joe J salt stick and bonk breaker will be here Awesome! and we'll, they'll be out on course. We'll have, um, samples at the expo. So that's a good place. Our event is sold out this year. Wow. I um, highly recommend that you check it out. The, yeah. the scenery and the gravel in Montana is pretty hard to beat. Wow. Um, yeah. And it's a very, we, we really want it to be an environment that is safe and welcoming and inclusive and where everybody can race and line up next to someone that looks like them and mm -hmm. find new friends. And we go out of our way to make sure that our event is like that. And so I think if you've never tried an event before and you're nervous about racing, Sam always says you can compete or you can complete our event and you will come and meet friends and see the most amazing mountain views and rivers amazing. flowing next to the course. Yeah. You should come check it out. Yes. I've been, I mean, I've, have obviously been following your, um, Instagram stories too. <laughs> it is Sorry. gorgeous. Yeah. Very gorgeous for sure. So, um, it sounds, yeah, I mean, cannot, cannot beat those views. So 
we talked about gravel clinics. Um, we didn't get to hit too much on the last best ride, but you did mention it's a nonprofit gravel race, right? Yes. So we became a nonprofit this year. Um, it's centered around raising money for our champion scholar award, which mm -hmm. is, um, a scholarship fund that I've dreamed of creating my whole life uh, as a kid growing up here, come from a pretty low income background mm -hmm. and had a lot of community help, but mm -hmm. specifically when I started applying for college and having access to local scholarships, it completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and as an adult reflecting back on it, I, I knew that a lot of it was the fact that people were willing to do that mm -hmm. for me and invest. Yeah. And so it's our way of giving back and creating some of those opportunities for women in our community. And we have actually opened it up to some tribal schools this year. And, awesome. um, half of our scholarships go to black indigenous or women of color. Amazing. So really working with multiple high schools and guidance counselors. And it's kind of interesting to tie a bike race into that, but um, as it turns out, a lot of people believe in helping young people yeah. have opportunities. So absolutely. Yeah. People have subscribed to this idea. Amazing. I love that. And so you said that's all booked up for this year and people cannot sign up right at this point, but, um, are there any links or ways people can sign up for the gravel clinics? Are we waiting for you? to? I don't have out? anything planned yet for next yeah. year. So okay. DVD on that. All right. And then for JoJ bars, people can find those at, at, at JoJ.com. JoJbar.com, REI, Amazon, Amazing. whatever works for you. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. And then um, people can, of course, follow you. If you want to share your Instagram handle, <laughs> that's up to you. Jess, Sarah. there you go. <laughs> J E S S C E R R A. <laughs> there you go. And, um, and thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation. I'm, and I mean, I'm sure we could have dove down a million other rabbit holes on all of this, but I think this is, I mean, perfect for our audience and, and your experiences is, is very, uh, I'm sure relatable, but also inspiring to, to many of our listeners out here. So thank you so much for your time, Jess. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs>